This interview is under the auspices of the Maria Rogers Oral History Program, the Carnegie Library for Local History, the Boulder Public Library. Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi has been a resident of Boulder since 1995. Among other things, he is the founder of Jewish Renewal, held the World Wisdom Chair at Naropa University, and founded the Spiritual Aldrin Institute. He has been active with national and international spiritual movements and is the author of many books. We are in his home in Boulder, Colorado. It is February the 13th, 2007. Liz McCutcheon is a videographer, and I am Shirley Steele. Rabbi, it's your turn now. I thought you might want to talk about what your early experiences were leading up to coming to Boulder. Uh, what brought you here? Well, first let me say this, that um, I've lived in many places. I was born in what was then Poland and is now Western Ukraine. When I was a half a year old, my parents took me to Austria, to Vienna. When Hitler came, we had to flee and fled to Belgium, from Belgium to France when the invasion came. In France, we were in two camps in turn. Finally, we came to the United States in 1941, and I lived in a variety of places, Brooklyn, New Haven, later on Rochester, Fall River, New Bedford. <laughs> you can see all kinds of places where I lived, Philadelphia. And, of course, for about close to 20 years in Winnipeg, Manitoba. If I go back and ask myself, where did I feel at home? The answer is in Boulder. And I thought I wanted to say this to begin with, because nowhere else did I have the sense of that kind of, here is home. And uh, the mountains, every time I come in from out of town and I see again, the landscape here, the um, uh, flat irons, and as we are coming down to, to Boulder, it just warms my heart. So I just want to say this. This is wonderful about Boulder. I'd been to Boulder a number of times uh, in speaking engagements at CU and uh, other places, and I was at, uh, invited by um, the people who were at the Unitarian Church and some other places. And then in 1975, I spent this, a summer time here when Chögyam Trungpa, uh, it was the second year of Naropa opening up, and I taught a summer course here. And um, there was something really special about meeting the people and the way in which, the level in which the conversation happened. And by the way, that's something that is so strong in Boulder. If I were to ask myself, um, where is Boulder and where is Colorado Springs, I would say they're not on the same <laughs> planet, as it were. There's something very wonderful about Boulder and the freedom of mind and, and so on. Another thing, uh, since I was always interested in ecumenical things, that's to say, <clears throat> going beyond the boundaries of our religion and meeting the people from other religions, because I had that um, intuition that when someone is involved with God in a living way, then the format in which that happens is less important than that experience. And then we can talk a kind of holy shop that I call um, the dialogue of devoutness. And that I've been able to do with many people in Boulder here, plus the fact that my degrees are in psychology. Now, all you have to do is pick up um, Nexus here and look at the list of people who are offering people helping, and you get the sense that Boulder is not only a town with a lot of uh, psychologists and spiritual practitioners, but there are even those who are the therapists of the therapists here. And every form that you need from body therapy to deep transpersonal psychology, you can have that here. And for me, this is a wonderful environment. So Boulder is, it has been very delightful for me. When you were uh, <coughs> uh, uh, in between the time you came to Boulder 
and the time you arrived here in the United States. Where, what was your uh, educational, in, just in general? Well, <clears throat> I, I studied at a yeshiva, that's where I got ordained, and then I had a master's degree from, uh, temp from Boston University, and I got a doctorate from Hebrew Union College, and I taught in Philadelphia close to 20 years um, in the Department of Religion. So these were the things that I'd done there, and so when I had a postdoctoral fellowship at Brandeis University, these were my educational backgrounds. And of course, I don't have to tell the people in Boulder about workshops and ashrams and <laughs> and retreats and so on and so forth. So I did a whole bunch of those. So in 19, uh, as you mentioned, 1995, I received the invitation to come to Naropa University that had a chair open that was very prestigious, um, calling World Wisdom Chair, you know. And um, it was wonderful. And since that time, I also spent uh, some years as regular faculty member in the Department of Religion of Naropa. And uh, I, what we have, what we know about it is that there, there are Buddhist connections, but you represented a different religion. On, on spiritualism, or did Well, a, a lot of this had to do with this wonderful trip that we did uh, take to Dharamsala. Let me step back. Yes. Sometimes in the 60s, um, I went to visit a lamasery in New Jersey, and there was this old uh, Tibetan geshe, uh, geshe sort of a professor. And I mentioned to him that people in uh, Tibetans now will need to learn how to survive in a diaspora, and that we Jews have <laughs> 2,000 years of experience in that, and I thought it would be helpful if we had those dialogues. It took quite a while because they needed to start, set up the infrastructure and so on. But then the invitation came and about ten rabbis came to visit the, the Dalai Lama in Dharamsala. And a book was written about it called The Jew and the Lotus. And it's a wonderful description of the encounters that happened there. And uh, so you, you felt really comfortable, I guess. Yes. Um, so Buddhism was... Uh, close to my heart, I think that there is something about the way in which Buddhism for export, that's an important word to use here, um, has uh, always dealt with the empirical stuff that people can do to expand their consciousness. And since I was interested in Judaism in the mystical aspect for the same reason, how do we expand? Do we expand our consciousness? What are the transformative means that our traditions offer us, so that we might be able to take our natural inclinations and become more enlightened beings? So that's what I mean by having the kind of uh, shop talk that I could have with people who are working on consciousness, because we're all human beings and we have the same inner setup. So it, it transcends religion and goes into psych with psychology, and mm -hmm. it unifies them. That's right. And philosophy. Probably. And that's what brought me when I was 60 years old to ask some deep questions about how do we spend the rest of our lives, because if you look at the way in which people have um, outlined what to do, you know, so you have neonate and then kindergarten and then school, and then uh, you go on further into, into the world, and so on and so forth. And then you see that the winter and spring and summer season for, of human life is very well scripted. But you don't have much of a script for the fall season of human beings, what I call the October, November, and December years of life. And so this is how <coughs> I felt that I had to ask myself, why was I not as happy as I could be? Because I was at the height of my uh, career, and yet at the same time was depressed. So I took a retreat and realized that it's because I wasn't shifting from that great active mode of earlier to a more elder way of doing. 
And I started to realize that we are being blessed with extended lifespan. And the question was, how do we extend our awareness to use that lifespan that we are getting? And that's how the spiritual eldering thing was born. And I co-wrote with uh, a person the uh, book From Aging to Saging. Ron Miller was my co-writer. And that book has been making its rounds. It wasn't a quick bestseller, you know, but people are still buying it because they're learning something about that phase of life in which we are at this time. So we then taught people how to uh, take people through the process, and we call it spiritual eldering. It's not the best name, it's not a very uh, fancy name, but it described what we're doing, because you can't do this work without going into contemplative inner practices that have to do with life review, with reconciliation with past things, you know, and so on and so forth. So that was the spiritual eldering part. Do, do people come? Uh, how do they get in touch with you? Is it through the book, or do you have any notions? Well, I, now I'm in my December year, so I turned this over to other people. There is a spiritual eldering guild, and they are doing remarkable work. About 120 people who have been trained to offer seminars in this field. Is that in Boulder? It was in Boulder and is now in South Bend, Indiana. That's where the headquarters are. So that, that tells you about this part. Well, let me go back a little bit uh, to uh, earlier times. I mentioned that I was studying in a seminary to be ordained as a rabbi. Um, you can imagine what it was like for me when I was a young person, having been uprooted from the city where I grew up. And Vienna is a beautiful city, still is a beautiful city. Eve and I were back a couple of times there. And um, the Holocaust was such a terrible thing, and the question was, how are we going to rebuild just the same way as the Tibetans need to rebuild their culture? How are we going to rebuild our culture? And for a long time, that's when I went into that seminary to study, was to be able to um, restore things as they were before the Holocaust. Then I realized after a while that restoration wasn't the answer, that we were going through a paradigm shift when you figure the moonwalk, you know, you go uh, Auschwitz, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, the moonwalk, fifth generation computer right now, the web, and so on and so forth. The world isn't the way in which it was before. And if I were to just think of restoring Judaism as to how it was in 1938, or 1939, that wouldn't be very helpful for where we are now. And that's how Jewish renewal was born. And we were very much interested in not only the external forms, but the spiritual things that was lost when so many people uh, who were our spiritual adepts were killed in Europe. So that's why Hasidism, Kabbalah, Jewish spirituality is so important in Jewish renewal. And thank God we now have two Jewish renewal congregations here. And even the other congregations, you know, have taken on some of the things that we have uh, done in Jewish Renewal, both in form and in content, so that people don't think anymore in fundamentalist terms about creation occurring in six days of 24 hours each and so on and so forth, because this is where Jewish mysticism was so helpful in expanding the the universe, the cosmos, to see it much wider. Another thing that happened in paradigm shift was that we now look at religions from a post-triumphalist point of view. What's a triumphalist? A triumphalist is what we are now seeing at this point in the battle between the Shiites and the Sunnis. Each one, you know, and the fundamentalist Christians are in the same way, and the fundamentalist Jews. They're all awaiting the Messiah would come and then prove everybody else wrong. Okay? There'll be a second coming and Jesus will say, you Jews didn't accept me the first time. Uh, 
the last avatar is going to show up or the imam that, that uh, Ahmadinejad is expecting is going to say that you all were wrong. And that is not something that we can handle these days anymore because we begin to see, once you have seen earth from outer space, you can't be a triumphalist anymore. And so I find that with many other uh, religionists, I can be a post-triumphalist person who are now thinking about how to heal the planet and how to heal our society and so on. So people like Father Keating um, and I have just wonderful conversations and with the faculty at Naropa, of course, it was the same. I don't know same. Father Keating. Pardon? I don't know Father Keating. Oh, he is the one at the um, St. Benedict and Snow Mass. He is uh, the person who has pioneered, together with Father Basil Pennington, a form of interior prayer that they call centering prayer, or prayer of the heart. And he and I did a beautiful uh, video together. Uh, I think it's called The Kiss of God or something like that. Uh, if you can... Um, borrow a bit and, and uh, uh, see if they will give you permission to uh, uh, feed in uh, a couple of uh, minutes of that. That would be wonderful. Uh, going into, back to Jewish renewal. Yeah. Um, what, what were some of the problems, if any, for, uh, in getting it started? Well, I, I'm kind of visualizing <clears throat> it. First there was nothing, and then there was Jewish religion. What came in between? Uh -huh. Well, it doesn't go this way, you know. Yeah. Everything has continuity. Uh, people were looking, first of all, how do you take Judaism as we transferred it from Europe to America? In the 1850s, people came from Germany, and they were the ones who had experienced Jewish reform, and so it was. Uh, the reform, uh, reform Judaism arrived here. Around the turn of the century, there were some people who said reform went too far and we want to be conservative. And this is how the conservative movement came about. In the mid-30s, there was a uh, rabbi, wonderful person by the name of Mordechai Kaplan, who said that we now have to do it and reconstruct Judaism. It is not enough to reform it or to be conservative liberals, but we have to go deeper than that. And that's how Reconstructionism was born. Well, Reconstructionism had a very low ceiling because it was very much connected with pragmatism and did not incorporate things that we learned in the 60s, 70s, about the expanded mind, and so on and so forth. And that's how Jewish renewal came on the scene. So it is a continuity uh, there. The other thing is that, uh, you know, seminaries did not want at one point to ordain women. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Reform people were, took the first step, and Reconstructionists and, and Renewal were the next ones who ordained women. And this is how Rabbi Tirza here, and Rabbi Nadia Gross are ordained because we believe that the world will not heal unless there's going to be feminine consciousness involved in that. And that the religions will be inadequate and only very macho, you know, talking about this business of triumphalist, you know, and that's very much a masculine thing. So it was necessary to bring in feminism. Another thing that was necessary was you know, Jews eat only kosher. Mm -hmm. But the question was, what is ecologically important here too? So I coined the term eco-kosher. There was also a question about how did, um, what went into the making of the food, did people get proper pay for the work that they have done? For instance, there was a time when there was, Chavez was um, doing the thing with the uh, farm workers in California, and we didn't eat the grapes, and we considered the grapes to be non-kosher, <laughs> unless they were union grapes, you see? Uh, I, the, I missed that. Yeah, that's part of, of asking the questions of eco-kosher. Mm -hmm. So um, then uh, there's so many other things that go into um, 
the use of meditation, of spiritual direction, all these things that used to be in Europe as part and parcel of the Hasidic movement, well, it couldn't be transplanted just that way here. While in Brooklyn and in other sections where there were enclaves, they transplanted it and they did recon, how would I say, um, restore what they had there. But for what happened out of town, outside of New York and those enclaves, it wasn't adequate. So we had to make sure that the processes that were built into Hasidism of spiritual direction, of celebration, of uh, both joy and how to deal with different things and bereavement and so on, that we created the the pastoral awareness that was necessary to be able to handle that because the average seminary was more interested in teaching the people the academic things of history and the text and so on and so forth and not so much about the transformative techniques. Your pastoral awareness, does that, is that centered in Boulder? Is, uh, no, it's all, now because right are? now there are quite a number of Jewish renewal uh, uh, groups, and for instance, we have a, a biannual meeting, and the, the next one will be in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and it's just so wonderful what uh, our people have produced in music, in poetry, in liturgy, in um, the sacred arts, and so on and so forth, so it's just wonderful what our people have done, you know, and I can be now a grandpa <laughs> looking at all that. Truly an elder. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, going back some into Naropa, I'm wondering how your work there fit in with the student body there. What, what were the students looking for who came to you or took a class, signed up to take a class from you, whatever that was? Well, I tell you something. Um, I, had a, I had a lot of fun, and they had a lot of fun with me, because the question was always, how do you take that learning that is not uh, packaging information and planting the information on people's heads? I had this remarkable teacher when I was doing my master's work at Boston University. His name was Reverend Howard Thurman. He was also the teacher of Martin Luther King, so I had a great, great, wonderful mentor there. And he was teaching things uh, in religion with labs. Now, you never hear about that, that people should use labs in, in the humanities, but, you know, that's wonderful. I think uh, he, was, he pioneered that. And it fits so much into my experience that I had from Hasidism before, because we had experiential things there too. So I studied under him. So when I taught at Temple University, I was also teaching um, religion with labs, especially psychology of religion. And when I came here, I did the same thing. And so the students were excited about the fact that they were able to experience things, then write their uh, reaction reports to what had happened. I also sent them out to various houses of worship so that they would observe things, and that was part of the, uh, of the learning agreement. <coughs> so then they came back with hands-on stuff. And when they, had, when they were in a, a hands-on lab, what would be the, can you think of a specific thing that they might, you might ask them to do? Well, for, for instance, <laughs> Naropa is wonderful about having uh, meditation things and, 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 you know, and practice week and so on and so forth. So that wasn't anything new when I would introduce them to Jewish meditation. As also, the use of body is important, you know. Uh, when you look at yoga, tai chi and so on and so forth, so the question was, what are the Jewish things in which body is involved? And we have in a daily morning practice body stuff that was there. Then we would do things with ritual. I love to teach a course for people. I call it Ritual for People Helpers. Imagine if you are a psychologist and you have been working with somebody and that person is about to have a wedding or any other life cycle event. 
They wouldn't want to go to a minister who doesn't know them because they've been working at a great depth with the other person. So then they would come to that and say, would you please do this wedding for me or would you please help with the funeral of my mother or something like that, right? So I wanted to teach the people how to do rituals for people helpers. And that was a wonderful course because then we would always set up situations and I would have them show how would you handle a wedding, how would you handle a funeral and so on and so forth. How would you be at the bedside of someone? What would you do in a hospice situation and so on? So this was teaching at Naropa was always wonderful. And the, the students would not necessarily end up in as religious uh, affiliates, but would carry, possibly carry that into other fields too. That's right. It wasn't, you know, that, that's the wonderful thing. I was, when people would ask me, what's it like to teach at Naropa? I would say, if you teach at a seminary, you are prescriptive. Mm -hmm. You tell people what to do. If you teach at uh, a secular university, you're descriptive. You're just describing what people do. At Naropa, I can be descriptive and prescriptive. And that was always a wonderful thing about it. The other thing that I deeply enjoyed was my fellowship with the faculty. They were they are all such wonderful people there. You know, nobody is at Naropa today because they want to make a pile of money because yeah. Naropa doesn't pay that way. I hear that. Uh, but if you are there, then you want to be there, you know, and the conversations I had with the people in the religion department, the psych department, and so on and so forth were wonderful. Is there anyone who uh, took that chair after you retired? Yes, there was, and his uh, Rabbi Miles Krasen, and I understand that he will be leaving next, and our department will continue. And when the time came for me to retire, I spoke with Yesod Foundation and with uh, Naropa and asked them to take my archives. And if you have a chance, look up www R Z L P, which stands for Reb Zalman Legacy Project. dot org, and you'll find a lot of wonderful stuff that will stay with Naropa, and will be um, <coughs> digitized and available for people. That's good. We I didn't say at the beginning of this, but uh, I have some material here relating to uh, newspaper articles about you, and that goes into the library archives, so that's wonderful. Have built up something like yes, that. yes. I'm, um, I don't want to make too big an issue of it, but I'm thinking since this is a, a history, that maybe you could define Hasid and Hasidim and the Hasidim. Sure. Just, just to fit it into. Well, let us say uh, um, that there have been several waves of Hasidism. The first wave was around the Dead Sea Scrollers, you know, and you imagine there were some people who left uh, Jerusalem and the settled places and went into the desert so they could sp practice their deep spirituality. And they were called Hasidim Harishonim, the first Hasidim. Then there was a group that was in uh, Germany in the Middle Ages, and they were known as the Hasidei Ashkenaz, the German Hasidim, and they were the counterparts of the Christian Friends of God. And when you look at Meister Eckhart and Johannes Tauler and all these people, so we had Judah the Pious, and he was known as Judah the Hasid, and that was a second group. The third group of Hasidism came when Israel Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism as we know it now, uh, was at the end of the 1600s and in uh, the Ukraine. And that was an amazing piece of firework. If you've ever seen fireworks, you know, they're going up and then they're exploding again, exploding again, exploding again. It covered Poland, Ukraine, Romania, Lithuania, White Russia, and so on and so forth, and Hungary, and Everywhere there were then later on some people who had become those charismatic leaders. And that's how Hasidism uh, came about. 
One of the lines of Hasidism uh, was known as Chabad Lubavitch. And I studied at the Lubavitch Seminary because it was the most contemplative group of them all. And they're now so amazing again because wherever you go uh, in the world, you may find a little Chabad house where there's somebody who will be um, maintaining things and teaching things and so on and so forth. All an outgrowth of Hasidism. Let me go back. About the time of the Baal Shem Tov, you see, you always have to take a look what else was happening at the same time. Um, and you see that George Fox, the Wesley brothers, Angelo Silesius, Jakob Böhme, you know, uh, Emanuel Swedenborg, there were lots and lots of spiritual things happening at the same time. It reminds you of what's called the Axial Age, when you had Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, uh, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zarathustra, Mahavira, Buddha, Lao Tzu, and Confucius, all at about the same time. So if you look at it uh, longitudinally, then you see it only in one tradition. But if you see it latitudinally, you see that in Gaia's consciousness, this kind of stuff was coming up. For instance, why did the Wesley brothers quit the Anglican Church? Because it was too dry, you know? It didn't have a method for be becoming a deep, transformed person. So they would go and knock on your door and say, brother, sister, I've come to inquire as to the state of your soul. <laughs> you know, that's wonderful stuff. So that's how it happened with Hasidism too. So, okay. Jewish renewal being an outgrowth or partial outgrowth. Yeah, I would say it's another phase. Jewish renewal, I call it the, f the fourth turning of the Jewish Hasidic wheel. I asked His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, I asked him the same question. You know, there's Theravadan Buddhism, there's uh, Mahayana, there's Vajrayana, and what you're now doing in Madison Square Garden with initiating people in the Gala Chakra initiation, well, isn't that the fourth turning? He didn't want to go into that. But it's true, it's a fourth. The way in which Buddhism has now covered the waterfront, you know, all over the world in some way, and at least the method of Buddhism, it shows up in so many forms of expanding awareness and knowing how to explore inner space. All that's the fourth turning of Buddhism, and I think it's also the fourth turning of Hasidism. And that's why you uh, get, you see the relationship between Buddhism and uh, Jewish uh, traditions. Yes, and the same way... Well, uh, that's the same situation that happens with the Sufis too, you know. Mm -hmm. Right now the Sufis are being persecuted by the Sunnis and the Shiites. But these were people who were doing the same kind of thing in Islam. You can't keep the spirit down, it wants out. And of course, Buddha, uh, Hinduism has had this wonderful long tradition of spirituality too. But then Native Americans aren't far behind with their stuff. Look. Uh, how much interest there has been in being with the shamans that come from South America, from the various uh, local people who are here. And that's, that's because people are saying it's not so much the um, polity of the religion that's important. It's a lot more important to go to the core, to the experience, to the center. I'm getting a little tired, so ask whatever else isn't finished yet. Well, I think that that would be a good place to uh, sort of wind up All right. along with you. And I guess my question would be, you've already talked about the uh, aspects of Boulder that are compatible with your thinking and with your work. What problems do you see in terms of Boulder and your work? There are all those miles on Route 36 between us and Denver. I would like to see more of Denver and Boulder and more of Boulder and Denver. Okay. <laughs>
In other words, um, there is that element that people have called airy fairy, you know, sometimes the head is in the clouds and so on and so forth. And um, things having to do with grounded uh, stuff and bringing in enough work and making it possible for people to earn a living here and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. That's one thing that's important. On the other hand, you know, uh, Denver could use a little bit of that spirituality here, and if we could also help loosen up the people in uh, Colorado Springs to be able to have a wider horizon than they have, then their Christianity would also blossom a lot. I think that wraps it up very well. <laughs> All right. It's so I just want to say one more thing. I, yes. You folks who are there, the most important part is that you bless each other. This world is currently under-blessed. You know, under-blessed world is like empty calories. Whatever we have, if we can treat it with that sense of bringing in the divine aspect to it, to fill it with blessing. Our Mother, the Earth, needs the blessing, and, we, and she needs the care. The more the people who are involved in business and other enterprises and in politics would be able to take the blessing attitude to their work that would lead to the healing of a planet soon. And bless you who watch this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.